Welcome to the Oasis Network Roadshow. My name is Tom Arnold, and I have the honor today of being your host for another great roadshow. We have with us today a gentleman by the name of Rick Johnson with Triumphant Ministries. Rick, welcome to today's roadshow. Thank you, Tom. So, Rick, I met you some time back through a mutual acquaintance. They were telling me about this gentleman that's doing a tremendous work in the country of Burma. (laughs) Yes. Now, Burma has another name. Tell us about Burma. Burma is also called Myanmar. They changed the name a few years ago to more reflect the people, the population, uh, more of a tribal country. And so it reflects more of the people. Burma actually come from the Burma tribe. So that's generally the reason they changed the name. So, Rick, tell me a little bit about this. You were in Burma. You're ministering. And since we're on the Oasis Network, this is kind of a funny story to start this road show. So you meet a guy. Here you are thousands of miles away from home. Yes. Tell us that story. It's a full 12-hour time zone shift from the U.S. to, to Myanmar because we're in the Southeast Asia. And so I'm over there meeting people, people that I don't know. And I meet this Indian man. He's a book publisher. He has a publishing house. And so we're trying to get some Bibles printed that we're going to hand out in Burmese. And so we get to talking. He and I get to talking. And he's like, so you're from the U.S.? I'm like, yes, sir. Do you know who David Ingalls is? And I'm like, well, yeah, I don't know him personally, but I know who he is. And he said, I just love his music. He said, I would love to to have some of his music. And I I told him, I said, well, I'm going to go back. I'll see what I can do as far as getting something for you. So when I come back, I went out to the the radio station, and I told them this story, and they gave me a couple of CDs, and so the next time I went back, I gave him those two CDs and made him very happy. Well, it's great to know that the Oasis Network is reaching a lot of people. (laughs) David Ingalls Ministry is certainly reaching a lot of people. So one of the things I think is interesting, when I think of Burma, one time I visited with a person, and they had traveled to many countries in the world. The person I'm thinking of right now had been to 100 countries in the world. Wow. And I asked him, I said, so is there like one country that when you go into that country, you kind of go, wow, I'm like on another planet. I'm not only in Mm. another country, but I'm like in a whole nother. And you know what name came to his mind when I asked that question? Mm. He said Burma. That was his expression. So tell me a little bit about the people that you're reaching there. Burma is, like I said, it's a tribal country. It's, It's about 55 million people. Uh, The country is about the size of the state of Texas, but it's very segregated with uh, tribes. There's like seven major tribes, and there's seven major divisions that make up the country. And the people there are some of the sweetest, kindest people I've ever met. I mean, willing to help you at at anything you want to do, you know, just because they're genuine. And especially when you're out into the village areas or out into the places where we're working, I mean, it's just the hospitality. I mean, they might not have anything but they'll give you what they have. They'll give you their best. And, I mean, it's it's really been educational for my wife and I to see these things and see how people treat other people. Rick, I heard you tell a story recently that I thought was really special, and that was really two stories. One of them was you were out ministering in Burma, and while you're ministering in Burma, you come across, is it like a Buddhist monastery or a Buddhist where yes, sir. monks yeah, are they're, they're all It's a Buddhist country. So tell me that story again, would you? Well, as we've been traveling there for years, uh, we've learned a lot about how to work with the culture, work with the people. And one of the things is we started going into these, uh, trying to attempt to go into these Buddhist monasteries. A lot of ministers there, especially there, have tried or, to go in, but they refused them. And so my director and I, we thought, hey, we've got some rice, and we'll go up here and we'll donate this rice. So we take a half a ton of rice in to the monastery and ask them would they like to have you know, this donation. And they said, sure. So we donated it. Well, the head of the monastery, the head monk, he asked me, would you like to talk to our ministers here? And I'm like, well, yes, sir, I sure would. Uh, I said, what can I say? And he said, anything you want. I said, you know, that's that's like throwing gas on a fire, you know, so that's why we're here. And so we sit there and we went from the creation to the resurrection and, you know, through a translator in about 15 minutes and just told them the whole story, the true story of Christmas is how I prefaced it. 
And since we were there during December, it was very easy to do that. So then we asked them, like we've been taught, hey, you know, this is a free gift. Would you like to receive this free gift? Oh, yeah. I said, well, this gift of salvation, it's really easy. And then we just led them through the sinner's prayer, and they all prayed with us. So I want to get this straight. Here you are in a foreign country. You're invited to speak in a Buddhist training center, we would say, or a monastery. Yes. And you present the gospel, and not only present the gospel, but you're able to pray with them the prayer of salvation. Yes, sir, we did. Yes. And it it was wonderful. I mean, it was wonderful. When we come out of that monastery, my director, who's lived there all his life, born there, he had tears in his eyes, and he said, Rick, you just don't understand what just happened. He said, this does not happen in this country. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm just grateful that the Lord used us to do it, you know. And so it just it just stoked us on a way, and it just added another tool into our box about what we can do to approach these places. Rick, years ago I heard a gentleman use the illustration of migrant workers that are harvesting you know, crop, how in the United States there's different parts of the U.S., there's different crop that seasonally is ready for harvest at different times. Right. And how we have to be willing to go maybe to one part of the U.S. and another part of the U.S. And you, know, you may reap cherries in one part of the U.S. and corn in another yes. part. And his idea was is that if you are have the mindset of I'm a migrant worker, that I'm just willing to go wherever the need is, wherever there's a harvest. I think when I hear your story, I'm just reminded that I realize there's a lot of doors closed in countries. But for right now, there's a wide open door in Burma. For you to share the good yes, news. Sir. So, Rick, will you tell me the second story of the school? I, I don't remember the details, but somewhere or another, God opened the door for you to go and minister at a school. This was this was special. We've been in Myanmar, you know, for 15 years, and you know, we plowed for a long time. And so, probably the first six or seven years, we try to go into a school very closed. We try to get close to schools, and they didn't want us there at all. They, in fact, they didn't even want you touching the sidewalk that touched the school. So, you know, because they're they're government schools, and so they wouldn't allow it. So we're out in a village one day. This is probably two or three years after that. And we're out visiting orphanages and doing things like that. And one of the guys in the van with us, he said, would you like to go to a school? I thought he was joking. I thought he was just messing with me. And he said, no. He said, I actually know the principal, the headmaster, and he will allow us to come in. And I said, well, I'd, I'd love to go. What, what do we need to do? He said, let me talk to him. I'll get back with you. So he did. And he come back. He said, the headmaster would like a small remembrance. And that usually means they want you to give them something. So I said, how small of a remembrance do they want? And so he said, they would like some notebooks and some pencils. I said, well, tell me the dynamic. What are we looking at, the demographic? He said, well, there's about 2,500 students in this school. You can speak to all of them and the faculty. And all you have to do is provide pencils and paper for the whole school. And I'm like, okay, well, let's figure out what that cost. So I think it was just r- roughly under $400 that we bought notebooks and paper for the school, and they allowed us an hour in front of their students, center stage, and it was silent. And so, you know, I do some magic tricks and things like that. And uh, the students, they, they love that stuff. And so we're up there, and so I tell them i got this one trick that's really good. I think it's pretty good. But anyway, so I'm up there doing it, and I said, I tell you what, I'll show you this last trick if you will listen to the story I want to tell you. I said, if you'll be quiet. So they were silent. I mean, there were 2,500 students were silent, man. So I told the story, again, the story of the creation to the resurrection through in a translator. And when we finished, I said, hey, do you guys want to receive this free gift? And they said, yes. And so we all prayed the prayer of salvation with these students. And then we passed out the notebook papers, and I did my trick. And it it was was another great day. That's a great story. If you're just tuning in here on the Oasis Network, I have with me today a gentleman by the name of Rick Johnson. Rick is a, a local to the Tulsa area, but right now he's living in Branson, Missouri. And he has a ministry, he and his wife, Angela, have a ministry in Myanmar, or we would say Myanmar or Burma, and they're ministering the good news of the gospel. And on the other side of the break here, we're going to come back, and I want to hear a little bit about how the Lord prepared you for what you're doing now, Rick. I mean, I think it's exciting to see what God's doing in your life, but I think our listeners would be really interested to hear that Rick Johnson's just a normal guy that was faithful in his local church. 
and God exploded him and brought him to the nations of the world. So yes, sir. we'll be right back right after this. I'm David Warren here with some exciting news for Oasis listeners. We have a new mobile device app. It's free, easy to download, and lets you enjoy our refreshing music and talk everywhere you go. If you have an Android cell phone, go to the Google Play Store. And if you have an iPhone or iPad, visit the Apple Store and search for Oasis Radio Network. Be an Oasis ambassador and share this news with family and friends around the world. Welcome back to the Oasis Network Roadshow. My name is Tom Arnold, and I have with me today a gentleman by the name of Rick Johnson. And Rick Johnson heads up a ministry called Triumphant Ministries, and his mission statement is to demonstrate, develop, and distribute the Word of God. So, Rick, welcome back on the Roadshow here. Thank you, Tom. So, Rick, you're a Roadshow listener, huh? Loyal listener. I, I listened to the road show for years. I had a job, and every day when it would come on during my lunch break, I would have the opportunity to listen to the road show. I listened to so many awesome people and testimonies and and uh, you, yourself and just everybody that has a part of that. And so it's just a blessing. It's an honor to be asked to be on it. So, Rick, tell us the backstory. How does God take a guy that's working for American Airlines and send him to the nations of the world. How does that happen? It's not really that uncommon, I guess. But, I mean, I think it starts with just being willing. For years, I was a volunteer in my church. Well, I started out in a, in a small church up in Collinsville, and I was up there for four or five years and just doing Sunday school superintendent and anything they asked me to do. And I left that church, and I went to Church on the Move there in Tulsa. So many great churches in Tulsa. And uh, ended up at Church on the Move. Uh, not ended, but, you know, it's where God planted us. And we were there for a long time. And so under Pastor Willie George, and so I learned a lot about faith through his ministry. And a lot of what the basic parts of just being, you know, bulldog faith, all those kind of things, just sitting like Flint to do what God tells you to do, to be sensitive to spirit. A lot of that I learned from him and just from, you know, doing it. And so not only him, but, I mean, his son, Pastor Witz, he's taken over. So I was under both of their ministries for years while they were there and while I was there. So it was just going to the church, and what I would do is I, I would volunteer for a lot of different things. You know, my wife and I, we were altar counselors, altar captains. Uh, we did prison ministry. We did uh, veterans outreach. We did nursing home ministry, homeless ministry, which we still do work with the children, you know, just whatever we could do to to work, to volunteer, and just, you know, as things come up. But in doing that, the local church rounded us into shaping us, and the more I sat there, the more I saw, you know, the possibilities. And, you know, when you start working with God, you start giving Him something. You know, I've always said this, and I've heard other people say this, so it's probably not originating from me, but God doesn't really want your ability. He wants your availability. And the local church is the awesomest place to do that at because they give you all the opportunities to learn, and they're usually needing help in a lot of different areas. So without the local church, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing now. But because of the experience I gained there at Church on the Move, it helped shape us into the ministry that we're doing now. While we were still going to church, you know, I was working a full-time job. My wife and I both were working full-time jobs at American Airlines. And we stayed there. And while we were still going working for American, we attended Rama Bible College. And then I went ahead and finished my degree at Oral Roberts University. And after that, I'm like, Lord, I'm, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I said, I've done my training and education. I feel like I'm, you know, at a good point. And I had a friend of mine, my best friend, John Smithwick. He has Global Ventures now. I went on a mission trip with him before he was doing a lot of stuff. And I went on that trip with him, and I come back, and I told my wife, I said, I know what I want to be when I grow up now. And so we went on our first mission trip with them, and then from then on, we just started going on mission trips. That's a great story. Now, Rick, I'm going to ask you to tell a story, so it's okay for you to tell how that you went back to ORU, you got a degree in business. Yes. 
And tell me what you graduated in your class. What number in your class did you graduate? Oh. Tom, when I was in high school, I was in the percentage of the class that made the top percentage possible. I wasn't really a serious student, and uh, I loved I loved school. I actually did because, you know, it fulfilled my whole social agenda, and I, I loved it. But when I got out of high school, I didn't want to go to college or any of that stuff. I went right into the military. I went into the Air Force, and I worked there for four years, got out of that, and got a job. And then later on, I decided, hey, you know – I might like to get a degree in something. So I started taking courses, and uh, I took, I don't know, 30, 40 hours of courses. And then I paused for about seven or eight, maybe ten years. And after I finished my time at Rama, my wife's like, what do you want to do now? I said, well, I, you know, I've got this on the table. I still would like to finish it. She said, well, you need to go to ORU. And I said, no, I don't think I need to go there because that's an expensive place to go. <laughs> she said, I don't care. God will provide, and we'll, you're going to go. So I prayed as I went to the transcript evaluator because I'd been out of school for a while, and I said, Lord, I said, I am getting too old to start this over again. I said, so if it be your will, <laughs> you're gonna, they're going to accept these hours. And so they accepted those hours, and they also gave me credit for some other things that I had done, some life experience things. So I enrolled in ORU, and for the next three and a half years, I went to classes every kind of way you could take a class, from correspondence to online to weekend university to self-pace, all of those ways. And when I got finished, when I got finished, my wife and I, we sit back and we didn't owe a dime for my degree the day we walked across the stage. And it's just a miracle from God. What the greater miracle is that I graduated as the most outstanding student in my college for academic achievement, which if you know, people that know me that went to school with me probably wouldn't believe that. <laughs> so, but I'm just like, it makes a huge difference when you're motivated and when you want to do it and you're working as unto the Lord. So tell me, Rick, for our listeners, we have them all over the United States, but we have a lot here in the state of Oklahoma. What city were you raised in here in Oklahoma? Oh, well, I was raised in southeastern Oklahoma in a town called Hugo and down in Choctaw County. It is about 20 miles from the state line of Texas. And so then you go through, you're faithful in your church, you go through Rama, you go through ORU. Now, there's a lot of nations in the world. Okay, so I know you oh, have yeah. a desire to go to any nation, but how do you kind of isolate? I really believe the Lord is calling us not just to any nation, but specifically to this nation of Burma. How did that come about? Well, you know, the word tells us the steps of the righteous are ordered. And like I said, it was just making myself available to different things. And I had, when I was uh, traveling, I mentored under, like I said, another ministry. And as I mentored, I, I was able to go to South Africa and to South America and India and different places. So I got a little sample of everything. And this one place just kept coming up, you know. And when I heard it, it's like, you know, I want to go this this man I was talking to was in Thailand, and he said, I'm going to take a trip up into Myanmar. And I'm like, I couldn't, I didn't know what Myanmar was, you know, and I said, what is that? Where is that? And he said, well, you know, it used to be called Burma. Oh, and so I got to thinking. My dad was in World War II. He helped build the Burma Road, and he had been there, and I said, can I go with you? Because I just wanted to go as a nostalgia thing because of my dad, and I just wanted to go somewhere that he had been. And uh, I thought that would be neat. And no no agenda. Well, it ended up this guy couldn't take us, and we went in with this other person, and we went in, and we did orphanages and all those kind of things. We did that, and I said, you know, I, my wife and I looked, and I said, let's go back. And so we went back, and we went back again. And every time we went back, we would add something else to our bag of tricks, whether it was, you know, giving bath towels out to the orphans or, you know, apples to the orphans. Or just add it, kept adding things to it every time we went back because, you know, I mean, the needs are great. So we were able to keep on doing things like that. And so as we did that, it just become more clear and clear that we really love this place. And I can honestly tell you, I love the U.S. I love this place, too. But I usually when I'm here, I'm thinking about being there. It's hard to explain. It's just, you know, many are called, few choose is all I can tell you. And it just the door opened, and we walked through it, and we've just been trying to get all the things set up there for us to do. 
So, Rick, you've mentioned orphans. Are there a, a lot of orphans in Myanmar? Tom, when we, when we first went, the first trip we went into Myanmar, we visited 15 orphanages in about seven or eight days. And anybody that's done anything like that, no, that's a lot. And we, cause we were spending time there in each one too. And so, yeah, we, for the next, I don't know, five, four or five years, we probably visited 170 orphanages and rarely went to the same one. I say we probably went to 20 of them twice. So probably 150 orphanages that we visited over, you know, a four or five year period, a lot of orphans, a lot of orphans there. And what causes that? I mean, why would there be such a disproportionate number of orphans in that country? Well, several reasons, but probably the top three, there's a lot of ethnic conflict goes on in Burma. So you have that element. There's not really any social services to speak of. So you have that contributing to it. They also have a thing that a lot of people don't realize, too, that if a husband and wife divorce and the wife wants to remarry the new spouse, if he doesn't want those children, he doesn't have to take them. So that contributes to some of it, too. I mean, it's just there's a lot of elements to it. So as far as the orphan aspect, that became something that became very close to your heart. And part of your ministry there is multifaceted, but part of it is specifically ministering to orphans, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, When we, like I said, the first few years, that's all we did because of it being a closed country. You're not able to just spread out. We can do a little more now than we could then, but you can't just do open air evangelism and crusade things there. If If you do, they're very controlled. We started going to these orphanages because it was just what the door that was open to us at the time. Each time we would go, like I said, we would learn a little bit more about the country and the culture and how things work because the country itself, I mean, the topography is very beautiful. I mean, there's, it's very attractive. There's not a lot of tourist things to do there, but the people make up for that way over anything else. You know, it's interesting to hear you talk, Rick, because most young people, if they had a hesitation to answer the call of God, they think, well, maybe God will make me be a missionary or send me some other country in the world. And I think it's touching for me to hear you say that even though you live in the U.S. and you're grateful for the United States, you serve in the United States military, but when you're here, you think about the love you have for that nation and those people. And the idea being whatever God calls us to do, he'll put a love in our heart, a desire in our heart to do that. So Rick, tell us about your website. What is your web address? Our website's easy. It's triumphantministries.com, just like it's spelled. So if somebody goes on your website, if they were to go, what's some of the information they would find on your website? Well, you'd see a list of our ministries that we were participating in there. Uh, we have basically five different ministry arms. We have our uh, our orphanage, Angie's House. We have our farm, our rice farm, Jehovah Jireh Farms. We have the Legacy Learning Center for vocational training. We have School of the Harvesters for evangelistic. And then we have our churches, Harvest Church. So you're active. That's a great thing to hear. So, Rick, we're going to take a break at this time, and on the other side of the break, we'll come back and we'll continue talking about some of these five different aspects of ministry that you're involved in there in Burma. We'll be right back right after this. I'm Karen Jensen Salisbury, one of the hosts you hear on the Oasis Network Roadshow. For 35 years, this one hour of the day has inspired and motivated you, our listeners, with thousands of stories of people whose lives demonstrate the truth that with God, all things are possible. It's an hour that you should make a part of your day, Monday through Friday, starting at 1 p.m. Eastern, 12 noon Central. The Roadshow, an Oasis Network presentation. In case you're just joining me for today's Roadshow, we have with us today a gentleman by the name of Rick Johnson. And Rick Johnson has a ministry in Myanmar. Maybe you've never heard of Myanmar. How about Burma? Have you heard of Burma? Burma is the country that he ministers in. Rick, we're so honored to have you on today's Roadshow. Thank you, Tom. So would you call the Myanmar people Indochina? Is that the name you would give them? Most commonly referred to as Burmese. Burmese. Uh, the people of Myanmar or Myanmar people. But is it kind of a blend between the, you know, the appearance of a, a person from China and a person from India? Is that kind of the blend or? Sort of. But, you know, really, they take on, I mean, Thailand, uh, Cambodia, China, the whole look. In fact, many of the Burmese look a lot like our Native Americans. That's very interesting right there. 
So, Rick, what is the predominant religion? What is the predominant faith in the country of Myanmar? Buddhism, hands down. Depending on what demographic you look at, it's anywhere from 90 to 94 percent Buddhist. And so there's at least about six to seven percent other religions, which Christian, some people say five percent, some people say seven, but somewhere in that neighborhood. So very few. So really, so what you could say is nine out of 10 people you see are Buddhist. Wow. So when you're there ministering, do you look up occasionally and see somebody from the U.S. ministering, or is it not a lot of missionaries living there? I mean, how would you describe the laborers from the U.S. there? Well, that's interesting. I mean, sometimes in the airport and sometimes in the hotel you'll run into people, but out in village areas, and this is interesting you ask me that, because I was over there one time at Christmas by myself. And I started kind of feeling sorry for myself. I'm like, you know, Lord, and just started praying, Lord, you know, I'm over here doing this, and, you know, does it really make a difference? And it's just like the Holy Spirit just spoke to me, and he said, how many places have you been where somebody else has been on this trip? And I'm like, nowhere. He said, well, don't ever ask me that again. Huh. So I'm like, I never have. And, I said, you know, from then that point forward, it's like, okay, these are marching orders. That's a great, I'm going to recap that. So you're praying, Lord, am I really making a difference? And the Lord asks you to reflect on where you've been and how many other missionaries or ministers have been in those areas and none had been. That's really special right there. Yes. So Rick, your ministry talks about demonstration, development, and distributing. Talk to me about those three words and why they're special to you. A long time ago, people would ask me, what do you do? What is your ministry? What do you do? And I would think about how to answer that question, and I really couldn't come up with a good, solid answer. And I got to think, this is actually what we do. We demonstrate, we develop, and we distribute. And all three of those, pretty much all three equally. But in the distribution, which is basically, you know, goods and services and things like that you help people out with, and that's just common. I mean, when we go into an orphanage, we're going to give them rice, and we're going to give them bath towels, And we're going to give them toys and some other things, you know, just out of the goodness of our heart. Then, you know, when you start talking about uh, development, you know, we saw a long time ago as going through these orphanages, how just how human trafficking works and how, how it works there, because people are pulled out of those things. And the reason they're pulled away from their home and family is because they're enticed with uh, opportunities that are false. And we felt like, hey, the, the reason they're done that way is because they don't have any vocation, they don't have any job skills, life skills, and we thought we could help that. And so we started development. So we opened our sewing school and started bringing young ladies in to teach them how to sew. And so that was the demonstration part of it. And well, that was the development, but the demonstration part of it was where if you do all these things, if, you, if you're giving people something to eat and you're teaching them a skill, but you're not telling them why you're doing this, if you're not telling them that Jesus is the reason I'm here, freely I've been given, freely I give, then you're missing the mark. Because, I mean, there's a lot of great humanitarian efforts out there. There's no shortage of humanitarian efforts. But, I mean, when you put the gospel with this and you tell them this is why we're here because Jesus sent us and we want you to have this gift that we're talking about, then that is what makes the demonstration part of it. So we're going in and preaching the gospel and uh, demonstrating with signs and wonders, and that is the reason we're there, the three Ds, demonstrate, develop, distribute. So I'd like for you to share with our listeners the sewing school. This is a very special for our listeners. I think you're going to love this part of it, the practical way that you're able to help these young ladies have a stream of income, support themselves, so it keeps them from having to go into you know, immoral lifestyle or very right. ungodly lifestyle. Well, the Word tells us hope in a future, and that's exactly what we're trying to do with the sewing school. We call it the Legacy Learning Center. With these girls, we're bringing girls from any area, from any religion, from any shape, no matter where they come from. We don't care. There's no discriminatory thing whatsoever. So we bring these young ladies in. They could be – our youngest student was 14, And I think we've had some that are 40 have come in. 
But we've been training these girls. We put no stipulation on them for anything. We don't charge them anything. Thanks to our partners, we're able to provide that service for them. But we bring the girls in. We put them in a year-long training program, and we could call it an advanced discipleship training. There's three things they're basically going to learn. They're going to learn how to sew. They're going to learn how to manage money. And they're going to learn business principles and ethics. And those three things coupled with just knowing that, hey, this was given to you. And the reason we're here giving this is because our partner sent us, but because we're doing it because of Jesus. And he's the reason for all of these things. So they, no matter what background they come from, they always leave as Christians. We felt like this was the way not only to get on the prevention side of human trafficking, that we could actually make a difference in their lives. You know, I think about, too, that, you know, we've heard the story, you know, the little boy throwing the starfish back in the ocean, and the man told him, he said, there's so many on the beach, and you can't take care of all of them. You can't save all of them. And he said, well, I saved that one, and I saved this one, and I saved that one. And that's how we feel about our sewing school. We might not reach everyone, but we're going to make a difference in the ones we do reach. That's a great story, Rick. That's a very special story right there. So, Let's just say a young lady comes into the sewing school. She's from a Buddhist background. You're wanting to present the eternal gospel of Jesus Christ. Talk to me about some ways that you kind of bridge that gap and you kind of talk to them about the Word of God and salvation. Well, number one, we have a weekly prayer time with them. And so we pray over our meals and we pray with them. And like I said, we teach them business principles and ethics. Well, our textbook is the Scriptures. So we're coming from the Word with that all the time about, you know, how to treat people and why we treat people this way. And the Word tells us that our gift makes room for us. And I think the biggest way is just us, you know, by us sharing, taking time out for them and for not charging them anything to do this, because we don't charge anything. I mean, it's totally free. And when they graduate, we make a big deal out of their graduation ceremony. When they graduate, I've yet to see them not cry or tear up because they said, there's no way we could have done this without you doing this. And I have to remind them, I said, it's not us, it's Jesus. So somewhere along through the discipleship part of it, as we're talking daily or weekly and showing them the love of God, they get it because they realize nobody else is doing this for us, but you are. And I'm like, I have to shift it. You know, I must decrease that God increases so that they can see the love of God. So do you pray with them to receive Christ, or is that usually a decision that they make on their own? How does that come about? Well, that option is going to come up multiple times in that year. I'll put it like that. Uh, We don't force anybody to become a Christian. That wouldn't be right either. And we don't want to put any guilt trip on them. Hey, we're doing this for you, so you should do this for us. Yeah. It's just a beautiful way that things happen. Because we treat them with respect and honor, I believe when we honor them, they honor us, and then ultimately God gets all the honor for it. Yeah. So they just they see it. But yes, that opportunity to accept Christ is going to come up multiple times in that year they're with us. So tell us about the church. What's the name of the church year? Harvest Church. Harvest Church. Yes, that's one of them. We have, All of our churches there are called Harvest Church. So let's just say I fly over to Burma and I go into Harvest Church and it's Sunday morning and I'm ready to roll, I'm ready to worship God. What's the service there at the Harvest Church look like? Well, you know, it, it's going to be real typical of what you see here. We're going to have our praise and worship time. We're going to have prayer time. We're going to, have, uh, we're going to take an offering up. We're going to preach the Word. We're going to have an altar call. I mean, pretty much the same. We do communion. We, we do all the things that you would normally do, water baptize, all of those things. Yeah. So one of the things I'd like to talk about is the investment that you have made in the country in that you build buildings. I mean, you have built facilities. Yeah. It's not like this is a, you know, we call it a brick and mortar type ministry. It's not everything's not online, right. so to speak. I mean, you're literally leaving behind something for the people. So I will tell you what we'll do, Rick. I'd like to talk about that facet of your ministry, but let's tell everybody about your website. If people are interested in going there, could you do that again, please? Yes, sir. I'd be glad to. Our website is triumphantministries.com. It's real easy to find. So I want to do this, Rick, before we take this break. Tell me about your wife, because I've talked to you on different occasions, and I haven't met your wife, but I know that she has been a big encouragement and a big foundation for what you all are doing. Tell us a little bit about Angie, would you? Well, you know, (laughs) that's interesting. Angie is a special, special lady. 
My wife, she grew up in the country. When you meet her, she comes off very ladylike and, you know, the nails and the dressed real nice and everything. She's always going to be dressed nice. But she doesn't mind getting her hands dirty for anything. I mean, if it comes down to cleaning a person or a baby or uh, birthing pigs or, you know, pulling a calf, my wife, she's all in taking care of animals. She doesn't mind any of that. She doesn't mind getting out there and getting dirty and, and sweating. And some of the places that she's had to stay while we've been traveling have been, I mean, absolutely horrible. But she'll do it. I mean, she she's right there with me every step of the way when she's there and uh, doesn't really complain, you know, doesn't do any good because it's not going to change anything. But she's all in. She is 100%. She is the ultimate helpmate for me. She encourages us. She makes up the difference. She'll pray with anybody. I mean, if somebody needs uh, somebody to come sit with them in their house while they're sick, she'll do that. She's just one of those kind of people. I mean, and I, I don't mean this, I don't want anybody to take this the wrong way, but when, when I first met her, she was so nice. I thought she was phony. I said, nobody can keep this up. And I mean, we've been married for over 20 years, and I mean, she's the same person now as she was then. I mean, she's just willing to help anybody who needs help. She's a special lady. Well... That's a special marriage, and it's a special gift to the body of Christ, and I love hearing that story there, because I think sometimes whenever I see some of these vessels, like yourself, that the Bible calls them chosen vessels, that you're willing to go into these remote areas and minister, and I see that such quality caliber of people that God has chosen, and they could have churches in the U.S., and you could have a very convenient life here, but you have chosen to use your life like a seed and plant it into the field of God's world, you know, the world around us, and let God use you to bring glory to Him. So we're going to take a break at this time, and on the other side of the break, we're going to talk about some of the facilities that God has allowed Rick to build and some of the things he's in the process of building, and we'll hear a little bit more about kind of the longevity and and the permanence of his influence in that country of Burma. We'll be right back right after this. I'm David Warren, Program Director at Oasis Radio Network and one of the hosts of this podcast. All of our hosts enjoy hearing from you, our listening family, so drop us a note. Our email address is roadshow at oasisnetwork.org. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast and you'll receive new episodes on your mobile devices. And now, back to the show. We're having a great roadshow today with my special guest, His name is Rick Johnson. His ministry is Triumphant Ministries. His wife is Angela, Angie as he knows her. And I want to say, Rick, we're enjoying today's roadshow. Yes, sir. You got some stories, huh, Rick? (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yeah. You don't do this without coming up with a few, for sure. I heard a person one time say this. You cannot have mission without having great fellowship, meaning anytime you're on God's mission doing what he wants you to do, the relationships that are built, the trust that is built, just the interaction you have with other people that are like-minded, how they right. have tremendous fellowship. But it, and he brought this out. It's possible for you to have fellowship. In other words, I'm solely interested in fellowship, but not have mission. You know, we have this friendship, but we're not going anywhere. Yes. And so I think when you go to other nations of the world and you minister out how you develop these relationships. So are the Burmanese people, are they really receptive to you? I mean, does that kind of validate them that you care enough to come and minister to them? When we first started going there, I mean, we're we're like just wide-eyed, you know, very naive. So we go in and, and you know, as we start meeting people, and each time we go back, we meet some more people. And But the ones that we've met, the ones that we've maintained relationship with that are close, you know, you talk about fellowship, but it's also relationship, too. And so we have both with with the ones we work with on a regular basis. But, yeah, because you show up all the time, you keep coming back, it makes a difference to them. And not only to them, not only to the people that we're working with, but the leaders of the community, it makes a huge impact. Yes, I remember doing an interview with LaDonna Osborne, and she shared that same point, how that if I never did anything but show up, it has such a encouragement to the local leaders that I would come 
from around the world, halfway around the world, yeah. to come visit you, and I care about you. And not only what it does to that leader, but what does it do to that community leaders, the non-believers that see that? It makes a statement. Oh, yeah. Well, they know that you're coming, that you what you're doing. And I think another thing, aspect of that too is uh, tom is that the fact that you know we never ask them for anything we're we're pretty much giving of ourselves, of our time uh you know what our partners have provided for us to help them with and so that makes it it makes an impact it really does well i think another thing that's made an impact is i'm holding here in my hand one of your newsletters and I'm looking at a huge building that you're building. <laughs> I mean, it's one thing to go and hold a meeting and then leave town. It's right. one thing to go in and, you know, speak at three or four churches and leave town. It's another thing to build a structure. Oh, man. So tell us about, you know, we're talking about the five different arms of ministry. Um, right. One of those arms, obviously, is this building <laughs> that you're building. Yes, there. sir. Yes, sir. Um well, you know, I, we were talking about your ability versus your availability. And, you know, about three years ago, I went all in. And so now I'm 100% of my time is spent with ministry. And so when we did that, right before I did that, probably about three, four years before that, we got a certificate of incorporation for the nation of Myanmar as a ministry. And that certificate opens doors for us that, is just most people can't get. I mean, it allows us to bring people in as consultants. It allows us to buy land. It allows us to do a lot of different things. So what you're talking about, a newsletter in a building, as soon as I stepped away from the job and started doing this on 100% time, we were able to purchase a seven-acre track of land there, and we're developing a campus. At the same time while we did that, 12 miles from that campus, we have a seven-acre rice farm. And so those, the coupling of those two things have allowed us to really step out into ministry. And it actually shows the people there that we're serious and we're coming back. We have a, a stake in the ground. But the building you're talking about, we started out, uh, after, I said after we paid for the land, that the first building I would put up would be our orphanage, Angie's house. And then we also had money to go ahead and finish the, the shower and toilet facilities for that, which is going to serve the whole campus. And now we're in the process of building what we call the Legacy Center. And that's going to be, that's, it's a three-story, 7,500-square-foot structure. And it's, like I say, steel and brick and mortar. And it's, it's, incre- it's going to be incredible. It's going to be our headquarter building. But it'll be the new home for the sewing school and so many other things. So tell me, let's walk through it. So floor number one, what's going to be in the legacy building? What's on the first floor? The the first floor, of course, will have some offices in it, but it's also going to be the home for the legacy learning center, which is really the sewing school right now. So, uh, but we're going to expand with a couple other vocations because sewing school is open for girls, but guys, if they wanted to do it too, can come. But we're going to open it up probably for small engine repair, for motorcycle, gas engines, things like that. And then we're probably going to do some kind of electronic or electrical repair on the other part of that, on the first floor. So here's what's unique, Rick. Do you mind telling the listeners what you did for 31 years with American Airlines? (laughs) Well, I was an aircraft mechanic. So that that's pretty much when I graduated uh, from high school. I went into the Air Force, and that's... All I've done for the 38 years was work on planes. So I'm sure you're sitting there some days, God, I'm turning this wrench, I'm working. And I know you had a very high position there. What was the certification you had on a... I was an airframe and power plant mechanic. Yeah. That meant you could pretty much work on anything on the plane. Is that correct? Oh, that's pretty much anything from a glider to the space shuttle. So you were very... It's pretty open. Yeah. So some way or another, you probably know how to fix those small engines, huh? Yes, sir. I have a background in small engine repair, too. But that's the thing. They use a lot of that over there. Well, can I tell you why I'm mentioning this, Rick? Because sometimes people are right in the center of God's will, doing exactly what God wants them to do, and they just can't see how this is any way this is going to fit into the future plan for God that God has for me. And here you are teaching these young men, will be teaching these young men how to fix engines or training others to teach them as well. And that's a background that you know something about. Right. Well, I didn't realize this until after I left, but a lot of working on planes, you know, because I worked in a heavy maintenance operation where you take them apart and put them back together. 
And doing that for years and years, repetitive work like that, it helps you be what they call project management and see how things are supposed to go back together. So it's helped me in ministry to be able to lay out a plan that is actually something you can build on. You actually know where to start and the next steps you need to go through. Of course, you know, the Holy Spirit's our guide, but it still doesn't hurt to have practical knowledge. Sure. I'm on story two now. Let's go through this legacy okay. building, and now we're going okay, up to second, the... the second floor is what we're really excited about. It's going to be the School of the Harvesters is the main thing that's going to be up there, and it'll be an educational floor, too. But the School of the Harvesters is going to be our evangelistic outreach. We're actually taking some materials and translating them into Burmese. We've been doing it for the last year and a half. We just now got, we've got three of our books we're going to use in that school. And so this will be taking nationals from there and other parts of the country, and they'll come to our school, and they will learn how to be evangelists. They'll learn how to present the gospel the way we know how to present it. We'll, we'll teach them how to use tricks, how to, and not tricks, but magic tricks. We don't call it magic there, but we're just tricks. And so we'll teach them that. We'll teach them street dramas. We'll teach them music. All the kind of formats that you could present a gospel in in a village setting or however you need to do it. And so we presented this in three or four churches there while we were there. And we had over 50 people respond immediately that want to learn how to train and learn how to do this. So we are super excited about that. So the second floor is going to be that. We're also going to expand it into a computer lab. So we're going to have, you know, some probably 10 uh, laptops or whatever up there that people can learn and train on computers. And so now let's jump up to the third story. I'm at this 7,500-square-foot building. Yeah, the third floor, we're going to use it for some dormitory space where we can house students. We also have open-air training up there. We'll put our language classes up there to teach English with. We're not sure what else we're going to do on that floor exactly. That's quite a bit up there if we start housing students there also. But the cool thing about it is the whole building will be used, and even the downstairs part of it, or the second floor, we'll be able to have church services in there on the weekends. So that'll be uh, it's it's going to be used all the time. Yeah. You know, I got a buddy of mine, and he was in Burma, and while he was there, he was wearing— I know they don't call it a skirt, you know, the men that wear, <laughs> but we have a picture of him wearing this skirt, and we yeah. kind of circulate that picture around me and some of my friends. Yeah. If we ever want to just kind of have a little fun with it, we take yeah. it. So oh, yeah. The, so the dress, is that what you're doing when you're there? You're dressing more like the locals, or do you maintain more of a Western dress? You know, I, I've i done that. I, a lot of times when I do that is to get a laugh in front of the kids because that— what you're calling a dress is called a lungy, and it's what they call a lungy. And if you tie it in the front, it's for a man. If you tie it on the side, it's for a woman. So, I mean, it's amazing the laughs you can get from kids when you're trying, when you're a foreigner and you're trying to put their stuff on. I mean, they really get a kick out of it. Well, I just honor you today, Rick Johnson. I honor your wife, Angie. I just can't say enough as far as just how the Oasis Network values people like you that are willing to take your life and willing to go where few people do go, and you're willing to pour your life out to be a blessing to so many. So tell us about your website again, Rick, please. Website is triumphantministries.com. And if you go to their website, as I understand it, there's a video that just tells a little bit about ministering in Burma and some of the things there. Is that correct? Yes, sir. There should be enough information. You can get in contact with us. Give us a call. You know, we're open to anybody. So also there's your Facebook page, and that probably gives more of a day-to-day updates on things. That are yeah, our, our, our Facebook page, it, and it's uh, Facebook is uh, Triumphant Ministries International. Yeah. All spelled out. Well, I want to say praise God for a man named Rick Johnson who left Hugo, Oklahoma, and came up to Collinsville, then eventually came to Tulsa, and then was faithful in his local church, and then went to Rama, finished out his degree at ORU, and now he ministers to a country named Myanmar. Rick, it's been an honor to have you on today's Roadshow. Thank you, Tom. Is there anything you want to say to our listeners on the way out? No, I just would say this. If you believe you're called to do something, don't wait till you get older to do it. Start taking the steps to get to that point now, because literally everything I've learned in my life, I am using in Burma right now. That's awesome. Rick, you've been an awesome guest. We love you, man. Thank you. 
On behalf of the Oasis Network, this is Tom Arnold, along with my special guest, Rick Johnson, saying thank you for joining us for today's Roadshow. Also, I want to say thank you to all of our sponsors and our Watchman partners for making today's program possible. I'd like to send you off with a passage of scripture that's found over in the book of Romans chapter 10 in verse number 15. And it says, how shall they preach except they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Join us next time for another great road show. You've been listening to the road show. If you'd like to write to us, Here's our address, The Road Show, P.O. Box 1924, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74101. Our email address is roadshow at oasisnetwork.org. The views of today's guest aren't necessarily those of this station, but we do appreciate and thank our guest for spending this time with us. The Road Show, an Oasis Network presentation.